be in the same room. <laughs> so you can see the, the YouTube streaming is now on. Um, and if you wanted to direct anyone, it would just be, it would show up on that page that I sent you. I'm sure there's going to be a specific video link once it's there, but. Yeah, I think I probably could do that now, but now I don't care to change my screens anymore. <laughs> yeah. I'll just wait another minute or so. Okay, I think we can get started. Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining our second to last CGD seminar of the academic year. I'm very happy to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Anna Deppenmeyer. Dr. Deppenmeyer is a postdoctoral fellow here at NCAR in the ocean section of CGD. And I just learned that Anna will be transitioning to project scientist in CGD in a couple of weeks. Congrats, Anna. Thanks. Um, she received her bachelor's in chemistry from the University of Göttingen in Germany in 2011, her master's in chemistry from ETH Zurich in 2013, and her PhD in climate science from Wageningen University in the Netherlands in 2019. She then joined NCAR soon after as a postdoc. Uh, during her PhD, she received an outstanding student poster award from EGU and the Chrysalis Award from the Association for Women Geoscientists in 2019. Anna is a physical oceanographer and climate scientist with a focus on the tropics. She's currently working on partitioning upwelling in the Eastern Tropical Pacific as part of the Pacific Upwelling and Mixing Physics Project. Today, she will present on seasonal to interannual controls on warm water volume in the tropical Pacific. Anna, the floor is yours. All right, let me get started. Um, can you see my, oh wait. Now? Looks great. Thanks, okay, and thank you so much, Katie, for the kind introduction. Um, yeah, my name is Annalena Deppenmeyer, and I'm a postdoc in the Inca Ocean, Ocean section, as you just heard. Um, today, I will be talking about work that I've conducted during my postdoc here together with Frank Bryan, Billy Kessler, and Lewin Thompson. So we will be looking at diabetic controls on tropical Pacific warm water volume, but oh, oh. <laughs> off to a good start. So to set the scene, um, we'll be listening to me talk about the tropical Pacific and watching a little video of sea surface temperature in the tropical Pacific. So what you can see here is the tropical Pacific um, spanning to the left over to the date over the date line and to the coast of um, South America in, in the right, which is the east. And we're looking at the tropical section, fift so 15 south to 15 uh, north. And so what you can see here is generally right now, um, cold sea surface temperatures, so blue is colder and red is warmer, um, colder sea surface temperatures in the east and warmer sea surface temperatures in the west. Um, these, this video is made of snapshot, well, not snapshots, of five-day averages so you can see we're resolving time scales of down to five days um, and you can see quite some activity um, happening here so for example now you're well now we're seeing an el nino form on the west um, there's warm sea surface temperatures and you can see some filament wave like structures expanding towards the west uh, from the east the tropical instability waves um, so the tropical pacific is an area of a lot of sea surface temperature variability and activity. So we'll just keep in mind um, that it's colder usually in the east than it is in the west. 
Um, but before we jump into the talk, I'd like to give you a short roadmap of what is to come. So we're going to be talking about what are diabetic processes. Um, they're in my title, diabetic controls on the tropical Pacific, but what exactly do I mean with that and why do we care about them? Then I'm going to introduce how we can diagnose these diabetic processes, um, where, when, and how they take place. And we'll look at the modulation of diabetic processes on different timescales from ENSO to subseasonal. And in the end, we'll wrap up by looking at how much diabetic processes contribute to seas of central variability potentially in the, in the tropical Pacific. So let's get started by what are diabetic processes and where we care. So I'm an oceanographer, Katie mentioned it. So let's jump right into the ocean and have a look. So what you can see here is an, a cross section along the equator. Um, so in the, on the left of the slide, we have west. On the right of the side, we have the east. Lower down um, of the slide is lower down in the ocean, and here's the surface. So I already mentioned that there is a sea surface temperature gradient, a zonal gradient in the tropical Pacific, where it's colder in the east and warmer in the west. So this sea surface temperature gradient drives trade winds that blow westward, and these westward trade winds drive a westward surface current. So what you have happening now is that your trade winds and surface currents sort of push all the water to the west. You get a piling up of water, um, different in sea surface height between the west and the east, um, which is a zonal pressure gradient. So you have more pressure where there's more sea surface, temp uh, sea surface height, and that sets the structure of the subsurface ocean. So I've denoted the thermocline here by the 20 degree isotherm. Um, the thermocline is where we separate the mixed layer from the interior of the ocean. So the steep temperature gradient, which is um, usually correlates really well with the 20 degree isotherm. And um, along this 20 degree isotherm or the thermocline, the pressure gradient drives the equatorial undercurrent of fast, really fast um, eastward subsurface current. And this current, the equatorial undercurrent follows the isotherms usually. So it's sloping up towards the east. At the surface, we have another effect happening. If we're just a little bit off the equator, Coriolis kicks in and will divert the water parcels that are moving to the west um, polewards. So we will have water on the north moving to the north, water on the south moving to the south, thereby creating a surface divergence, um, which due to mass continuity needs to be replenished by water from below. And this is what we call the upwelling. And this Upwelling is often talked about in a sort of offhanded manner. Um, it's mentioned there's some upwelling, sometimes there's warm upwelling, sometimes there's cold upwelling, um, but it's usually not very well known what exactly, what exactly is meant and um, how do we quantify this process. And that's because upwelling is really hard to measure. So we, from observations, don't know a whole lot about it. And that's because usually the way that you derive upwelling is from the divergence. So you take the difference between uh, flow across a northern boundary, flow across a, a southern boundary, same east to west, and then that difference is the upwelling. Um, and this is a small difference between two large numbers, which is very prone to errors. So I'm just going to show you a couple of estimates for this upwelling. Um, that have been derived over the last decades. So this is one that Weisberg and Chow derived from um, the TIW mooring array in 19, you know, in, in 2000. Um, here's another estimate of up, upwelling from a theoretical model of the equatorial uh, Pacific using observations also. Um, and then another one, a more recent one. And what's really interesting about this so you can already see that um, in one of the estimates, the upwelling becomes negative below a certain depth. In the other, in the other estimates, the upwelling remains positive throughout this depth. Um, but what's really interesting is if you put error bars on this letter estimate um, that Johnson, McFadden, and Faring have done, then you can see that the error bar really spans all the estimates and is almost as big as the upwelling itself. So it's really hard to um, to estimate to make this upwelling from observations. Another thing about the upwelling is that we can, we think of it conceptually as being composed of two components. So the first component 
is if we just take the equatorial undercurrent, and I've already talked about it flowing to the east, but sloping upwards. So this is a vector that has two components, a vertical and a horizontal one. So it could be that one part of the upwelling is actually just the equatorial undercurrent moving up as it moves east. So this is an adiab adiabatic upwelling. It means that um, there's no water being transformed, like 20 degree water on the side here still remains 20 degree water here, and it's just flowing up along the isotherm and that's the upwelling. Another part of the upwelling is the diabatic component. And that's the one that I'm interested in and I would like to quantify. Um, so diabatic means that the water parcel as it moves up actually changes temperature. So I've denoted this here as this sort of um, crossing arrow crossing the isotherm. And what you can see here is that um, if you're here, your water parcel is colder than 20 degrees. And if you're here, your water parcel is warmer than 20 degrees. So a water mass transformation has taken place. Water has changed its, its uh, properties or its temperature properties from colder to warmer. And it's this diabetic process that I will want to drill into, but um, I just want to repeat that we really don't know which part of the upwelling plays the bigger role and how, how this comes about. So one other thing to notice before we um, go on is that everything above this 20 degree isotherm is not only, the 20 degree isotherm doesn't only denote the thermocline, but it also bounds the warm water volume. So everything in this region here, in the light region, is what we call the warm water volume. It's warmer than 20 degrees. And on interannual timescales, the warm water volume can increase or decrease. And we care about that because the warm water volume is relevant for ENSO forecasts. Um, so what I'm showing you here is our time series of warm water volume in the equatorial Pacific in black and the NINU 3.4 SST anomaly index in red. And what you can see is the black curve, so the warm water volume, usually precedes the peak of the red curve. So it's a good predictor. Um, this is a bit kind of a, of a by eye estimate. We can quantify this by doing a lead lag correlation between the warm water volume and the sea surface temperature um, for the full tropical Pacific warm water volume. And then we can see that we get maximum um, correlation at lead times of six months where warm water volume leads the sea surface temperature. So again, if we know the warm water volume, we can predict what the sea surface temperature is going to do. And this correlation is even increased if we don't look at the entire Pacific, but if we look primarily at the Eastern tropical Pacific, though the time scales shift. So then we're only three months out. Okay, so let's have a look at what contributes to the warm water volume in the tropical Pacific. There's a theory called the recharge discharge oscillator. Um, and according to this theory, the most important part of the warm water volume budget is the meridional advection in and out of the box. And by box, I mean a northern and a southern boundary um, and below bound by the 20 degree isotherm again. So let's walk a little bit through the um, process of the recharge discharge oscillator and how this contributes to the warm water volume. So imagine you have a cold sea surface temperature anomaly in the east and warm waters in the west and where the warm pool is. So what you will get is an increased water circulation, so increased surface wind stress um, to the west. And this now in this recharge discharge oscillator theory is connected to the sweat drop balance that connects the meridional transport, vertically integrated meridional transport to the wind stress. In this case, where we have stronger winds, we will have increased meridional transport towards the equator. So we have convergence on the equator, which leads to an increase in the warm water volume. So this theory is <laughs> it's good, it's good and well, but it completely ignores the upwelling from below. It doesn't completely ignore it, but it's not an explicit part of the theory. The theory goes that we have inflow, uh, um, inflow and the warm water volume increases and then upwelling is sort of an afterthought after. Um, but we can also imagine that upwelling might play a more active role because if we think that there's a lot of water coming in from below in this cross isothermal diabetic upwelling way, then we can also increase the warm water volume by, for example, 
this dashed um, surface here. Okay, so now um, what I would like to do is I would like to have a look at this arrow that was there on the for former slide to see uh, how, how can we increase the warm water volume um, with the diabetic um, with the diabetic process. And so we're going to look at how we can diagnose this diabetic process. And that can be done in two ways. Um, I'll walk you through them. One of them is a kinematic estimate from mass conservation. So on the left-hand side here, we have the cross isothermal velocities. Um, this needs to be integrated. Um, so we get both components, the cross isothermal velocity through the upper part of the isotherm, uh, isotherm that bounds the layer or the lower isotherm that bounds the layer and the lower isotherm that bounds the layer. Um, and the way we get these quantities is by taking the divergence in temperature coordinates. So we need to transform our data from depth to temperature. And then we need to also take into account the tendency of the isotherm um, as it moves and contrib might contribute or negate the effect of uh, the diabetic process contributing to warm water volume. This way, it's usually done in observations because we can imagine that we measure velocities and temperatures along some cross section maybe a north of the equator, south of the equator, east and west, and then we can solve this um, continuity equation that way. In the model, we have an advantage because we have more data and we have more information. So we can also solve for the cross isothermal velocity in a thermodynamic way. So in this equation, um, which is, by the way, nicely derived here in this Grosskamp uh, annual review paper, in this equation, we get the cross isothermal velocity from the projection of motion, temperature direction into the cross isothermal direction. So that means that if my isotherm is like this and my flow would go this way, I'm now projecting my flow into the temperature gradient. And then we also, again, need to take into account the movement of the isotherms because I can have some flow in the direction of the temperature gradient, but if it moves just along with the movements of the isotherm, I'm not getting any cross isothermal motion, which is the quantity that we're interested in. And some of you might have recognized that this is the left hand side dt dt of the heat budget um, divided by the magnitude of the temperature gradient. So what we can do now, if we have these heat budgets ter budget terms, so we can not only quantify the cross isothermal velocity, but also attribute the cross isothermal velocity to um, the physical processes that drive it. So this would be the uh, vertical divergence of solar penetration, the vertical divergence of the vertical mixing, uh, turbulent heat flux, and the horizontal mixing. Okay, as a recap of what I've said so far, is I will be describing the diabetic component of the total upwelling in terms of water mass transformation. And in this situation, water mass transformation means that imagine you are a parcel on the equator, below the 20 degree isotherm, so you're colder than 20 degree isotherm. And now through some process, you cross this isotherm and you have now a warmer temperature than you had before. So this means this is a water mass transformation process. One last thing before we get to the results is um, in this thermodynamic estimate, we project the motion into the gradient of the temperature. So here, where I drew this arrow upwards, I can draw it upwards, so it's strictly a vertical upwelling because the, the isotherm is horizontal and the gradient is vertical. Um, when, if we are in situations where the isotherm sloped, the gradient of the, and the temperature gradient might not be strictly vertical. So if we get close to the surface and we are in an area where the isotherms are sloping, we might not be talking about, uh, about upwards velocity, but water mass transformation in, for example, the meridional. Okay, enough background. Um, let's talk about where, when, and how these diabetic processes take place. And I need, to, I need to mention that I diagnosed this from high resolution ocean model output, 36 years of pop global ocean model, um, nominally 10 kilometers horizontal resolution with 62 vertical levels. Um, this model has been forced with realistic JRA 55 um, reanalysis surface forcing. And we have the full heat budget output as five-day averages. 
And now let's look at the diabetic contribution to the warm water volume or diabetic transport across the 20 degree isotherm in the tropical Pacific. And just because I, um, I already know that the West and the East are different, I'm gonna show you the, West, the results for the Western box and the results for the Eastern box. Okay, so this is a time series of the area integrated cross isothermal transport across the 20 degrees Celsius over the box, the red box that was just shown on the slide before. On average, there's 0.7 sweaterups um, going into the warm water volume through this diabetic process. Uh, there's a little var variability, but not all that much. Um, so let's have a look at the east. And in the east, it's a vastly different picture. There's on average seven sweaterups going into the warm water volume through the 20 degree isotherm through this diabetic process. And there's considerable interannual variability, um, as you can see here by this low, low frequency variability. So these results were derived from this kinematic estimate where I take the divergence in temperature coordinates and the intensity of the isotherms. And as a sort of proof of concept, I'm now going to compare these results to the results derived from the thermodynamic estimates. And what do you know? They work out pretty well. <laughs> so um, the thermodynamic estimates uh, agrees with the kinematic estimate, which you know is a good sign. Um, and we still I, we still have this really large contribution in the eastern box of cross isothermal velocity to the warm water volume. Okay, so this is the integrated sense that a lot of people look at because observation constraints, usually we have to take an, an area integral, um, but we have the model, um, which allows us to also zoom in on not only that these on average seven sweat drops are being transported across the isotherm, but also where does this happen? So we're now going to move on to a map view. And we're going to look at a map of water mass transformation or and cross isothermal velocity. I use these terms interchangeable interchangeably um, on the 20 degree is isotherm. So one thing before we look at this picture to note is because I'm talking about cross isothermal velocities, they're really most meaningful if you look at them projected on an isotherm. Um, but this isotherm is not at the same depth at all parts of the basin, right? So we know that in the West it's warmer, so the 20 degree isotherm is likely to be much deeper than in the East. Okay, with that said, um, we were just looking at a box of roughly from here all the way over to here um, of the cross isothermal velocity integrated. And now you can see that the integral or the, the um, contribution to this box average is really not coming from an evenly distributed upwelling, diabetic upwelling all over the map, but it's really closely located on the equator, as you can see here. Um, so again, we will take advantage of the model output that we have and now not only look at a map, but now we can also see um, column resolve processes. So what would happen deeper or higher up in the water column uh, in colder or warmer temperatures? And we're going to be looking at that at 140 West. Okay, so now we're looking at a cross section across the equator from five south to five north. And the y axis still is temperature. So this is in isotherms. And because I'm showing you isotherms, um, they don't exist all the time. So I have put this hatching on when um, the isotherm exists for less than 50%. So you can imagine at 140 West, the temperature isn't only always 25 degrees at the surface, it's sometimes 28 degrees and sometimes 20 degrees. So we have vanishing and appearing isotherms. And so we need to keep track of where, where in the water column we are. And I indicate this by the, by the hatching. And I can tell you that the curve is pretty steep from 70% present to 30% present. So it doesn't really matter which, whether I choose 50% or, or another value. Okay, so um, let's look at what we see. So what we've see, what we've seen before from the map is basically was this, and then expanded with longitude, and now we can see that um, what we saw this really closely confined to the equator signal of water mass transformation um, actually reaches much higher into the 
thermocline into the water column, uh, though not much lower. So the 20 degree isotherm is, looks, looks to be the lower bound of where diabetic processes are happening. And then we note that um, most of these water mass transformation processes are confined to the equator uh, up to maybe 24 degrees Celsius. But then off the equator, we get some water mass transformation happening closer to the closer to the surface, as in on warmer temperatures. Well, this is not necessarily closer to the surface because the temperatures on the equator are also colder than they are off the equator, right? So that explains part of this V-shape. And then we can also to see water mass transformation happening in the warmer temperatures. So this would be the 26 degrees Celsius isotherm. Uh, and here I need to remind you of the fact that when we're in these warm temperatures, we're likely in the mixed layer where the isotherms are not horizontal, but they're sloping upwards. So we have the production of motion meridionally. So this is likely moving water being transfor transformed poleward rather than vertical. But if we neglect the very upper temperatures and just look at the thermocline where it's a good approximation that the projection of motion into the gradient is actually vertical, we can now compare this diabetic estimate of upwelling to the total upwelling. So below here I have the um, and I have the total W, the Eulerian velocity. And this is in depth space. So I put the isotherms that I'm also denoted by these dotted lines on here, just so you can see, and uh, so you can orient yourself. And I will notice that while there's some slanting here of these isotherms, it's a pretty good approximation that the temperature gradient is vertical in the thermocline, again, from 24 to maybe, maybe even 18, 20 degrees. Um, but then higher up, as I've mentioned just now, the 26 degrees really slope. So this temperature um, layer, the cross and velocity in this temperature layer is meridional rather than vertical. But if we focus on, on the thermocline, we can now answer the question of how the upwelling is decomposed into diabetic and adiabetic part, because we have explicitly calculated the diabetic part of it. And we can better see that by eye by looking at a profile. So we're looking at a profile at 140 west on the equator. And I'm showing the cross system velocity here in this solid blue line. And you can see that it increases um, down to 90 meters, which is the 24 degrees Celsius isotherm. And then it increases and then decreases again towards the 23 Celsius isotherm. And in orange here, we have the Eulerian velocity shown here on the lower left. And if you compare the two, then you can now see that the cross astronomy velocity is roughly a third up to a third of the total Eulerian velocity. So that means that two thirds of our upwelling are diabetic. They don't change the temperature. They just arise from this equatorial undercurrent sloping up with the isotherms. Okay, but we still have one third of the upwelling diabetic. That's a considerable amount. And now with this temperature, um, temperature budget based equation of cross system velocity, we can drill down and see what enables the water mass transformation. Okay, so this is just a repeat of the picture I've shown you just now um, cross system velocity across the equator in temperature space. But now we're decomposing it and using the right hand side of the equation that I don't expect you to remember. I put the expression for the vertical mixing contribution to the cross system velocity down here. And so, yeah, I've already mentioned this is the vertical mixing uh, contribution to the cross isothermal velocity. The first thing you might notice is that there's two different colors. So we have cooling and warming of water masses. Um, and this is because we're not looking at the turbulent heat flux directly, but we're looking at the vertical divergence of the turbulent heat flux. So that means that from the surface, the turbulent heat flux increases and then it reaches a maximum and it decreases. And so the divergence can change sign. And that's why we have two signs of the cross isothermal velocity due to vertical mixing. The next thing you might notice or that I will make you notice is that in the thermocline, so between 20 and 24 degrees Celsius, the signal uh, of vertical mixing induced cross isothermal velocity really closely resembles, it resembles the total cross isothermal velocity signal. Um, but the surface looks different, of course. So why is that? And what um, counteracts that? And that is solar penetration. 
So solar penetration can also lead to water mass transformation by warming uh, water masses. So this only has one sign because the divergence of solar penetration only has one sign. Um, and now what we can do is we can see, okay, these two, they already by eye look pretty good, um, pretty close to this total signal that we can see. Um, so I, I remind you that this total is calculated from the mean advection divided by the magnitude of the temperature gradient projected into the temperature gradient. Um, and these are calculated from the expressions down here. And if I sum the two of them up, then I recover a signal that's very close to the total cross isothermal velocity. So we can conclude that in the mean, cross isothermal velocity is driven by solar penetration, specifically close to the surface. And in the thermocline, it's driven by the divergence of the turbulent heat flux due to vertical mixing. Okay, so we've looked at um, we've looked at where di why, where diabetic processes happen and what drives them. Let's now look at their modulation on various timescales and starting with ENSO. Um, there's a reference for a paper recently published on this, if you're interested in more. Okay, so let's start by seeing, is there a modulation of cross isothermal velocity? And I'll just remind you that we're interested in this because um, if there's a modulation of cross isothermal velocity, that could influence the warm water volume budget, right? Which is a good precursor for El Nino um, and is related to El Nino. So we really wanna understand how this process happens and whether it does influence um, the warm water volume and therefore in so. So I'm showing you here the time series of the new 3.4 index from the POP simulation. Um, I've denoted the El Nino phase in red and the linear phases in blue. And for um, this decomposition into the different phases, I average over all the red for the El Nino, all the blue for La Nina, and all the white regions for the neutral phase. Okay, so on the left-hand side, there is the cross thermal velocity in the mean, the total long-term mean again, just to remind you what that looked like. And now here on top, we can see the different time averages for the El Nino conditions, neutral conditions, and La Nina conditions. And what I'd like you to notice, or what you probably notice, is that during El Nino, um, there's still some water mass transformation happening here, very close to the surface. And we already know that that's probably solar penetration and not so much upwelling. Um, on the equator, we have not only confined and uh, we have water mass transformation not only confined to the warmer temperatures which can be expected because El Nino, we, during El Nino we have warmer temperatures but also much less water mass transformation so it looks like there's a partial shutdown of diabetic processes during El Nino um, which at least amplifies the warm water in the warm sea surface temperatures during El Nino because we're not cooling from below, right? Um, the neutral phase just you know resembles the total um, total long term mean, and during La Nina we notice that we have very strong, uh, very strong water mass transformation extending into the colder temperatures, which again is not only due to us having colder temperatures near the surface, but it's really also a stronger signal. I should say that all these colors are on the same color scale as the one on the left here. So now we can again do this decomposition that we've done for the mean and look at what drives this modulation of cross isothermal velocities. And we can notice that um, again, this is the vertical mixing component um, as you've seen before. And you notice again that the signal on the equator and in the thermocline of the vertical mixing component is really close or basically explains the signal of the total cross isothermal velocity. And then we have uh, solar penetration, uh, again, canceling the, the um, negative effect at the surface. One other thing that I wanna just point out is um, that during La Nina, we also have seemingly stronger water muscles to the surface, um, which we agree is driven by the solar penetration and it looks sort of stronger here uh, during La Nina than it does during El Nino. 
And so you'd wonder why would that be? Um, I mean, it could be due to, well, this is an ocean model, right? So we don't have changing clouds, something we have uh, realistic. So it could be due to different solar, um, different solar input, but likely uh, it's also due that we have it, we have the solar penetration much closer confined during La Nina than during El Nino, which could be because during El Nino, sometimes we have these warmer, really warm temperatures and they don't exist all the time. Um, so you need to, again, take into account that this is not averaging in depth, but it's averaging in temperature space, uh, which if during the El Nino, uh, El Nino, excuse me, during El Nino, where we might have a broader range of different warm temperatures, we also average over a broader range of temperatures. Okay, that was a little excursion, um, um, but the, the total balance that we have established from the mean still holds. The cross isothermal velocity is mostly influenced by the vertical mixing driven cross isothermal velocity and by the solar penetration. And there is a significant, um, significant modulation of cross isothermal velocity during the ENSO cycle, which can contribute to, to um, amplify the feedback of El Nino being warm because there's less cooling and La Nina being cold because there's more cooling. Okay, so that's on El Nino timescales and I promised um, various timescales. So let's move on to how the 20 degrees Celsius um, cross as velocity changes with the seasonal cycle. And here, um, okay, so this again is this map that we've looked at in the for the mean in the very beginning of cross isothermal velocity at the 20 degrees Celsius isotherm um, from west of the dateline to South America and eight south to eight north. And what you can see is a quite strong modulation of the seasonal cycle of, of water mass transformation with the seasonal cycle. So the first thing you might notice is that in June, July, August, we have very strong cross isothermal velocities at 20 degrees Celsius. Um, sort of a little less in fall, even less in winter, and then hardly anything in March, April, May. So now this looking at cross isothermal velocity at an isotherm might pose a bit of a problem because this isotherm also exists in different conditions throughout, throughout the season cycle, right? Because we have warming in spring and cooling, um, and and cooling, later on so maybe only looking at the 20 degree isotherm is at least for this process not the best way to do it and just because we have to keep in mind where we are in, in the water column so um an average that i think might be more helpful is maybe average over the complete thermocline which is from 20 to 24 degrees celsius um but you can still see that uh, there's basically the same modulation of cross thermal velocities, uh, still lots, um, lots happening in summer and less happening in March, April, May. And the other thing you might notice is that um, even though now we're taking into account more uh, temperature, uh, more temperature layers, uh, on during March, April, May, the cross thermal velocity is confined really closely to the equator, um, whereas we can see some off equatorial signal, especially in wind in summer and fall. So let's again take advantage of the model results that we have and look at the, the water column rather than just a map. Again at 140 West. Um, and here you can see, well, let's focus on the area between the horizontal bars first. And that's the horizontal bars are the 20 and the 24 degree isotherm. So and in, in in uh, text here, I put the average of cross isothermal velocity on the equator between these bars. And you can see basically what we've seen in the map that there's um, very little cross isothermal velocity happening here in March, April, May, and much more and less of um, a variation in the other seasons. And again, we can kind of see um, some strong cross isothermal velocity happening here. Um, but it doesn't penetrate the thermocline it's sitting at warmer temperatures. And we can zoom into the seasonal cycle even more 
So now I'm showing you the seasonal cycle on the equator at 140 west um, with isotherms. And again, denoting the 20 and the 24 degree isotherm here. So um, I'll just briefly repeat what we've just already seen that here in, in spring, we have these considerable process from velocity. So there's water mass transformation happening up here, um, but it's above the thermocline. And then in fall, in summer and fall, we have process thermal velocities happening um, more in the thermocline. And actually there's even a negative contribution up here. So now we can do the decomposition again and look at where is this cross thermal velocity coming from. And we notice, um, okay, I'll, uh, I'll look over here right now and so I can see this better. So the cross thermal velocity, let's start with summer where again, we can see as for the El Nino and La Nina and as for the mean that there's enhanced vertical mixing contribution of cross thermal velocity um, during summer and it's penetrating deeper into the thermocline. And that's what we can see up here too, right? So this signal resembles that. Um, we have a sort of thin um, layer of solar penetration um, that doesn't completely cancel the cooling effect of cross thermal velocity um, up here. And now in um, March, April, May, we still have some contribution of, cross of vertical mixing here, but you can see that if you compare the total signal and the vertical mixing signal, they resemble each other much less than they have in the mean and during El Nino, La Nina, and also during summer. So here we have a different balance where the cross thermal velocity is not only driven by the vertical mixing, in the thermocline just doesn't really happen in the thermocline all that much, um, but it's really dominated by the solar penetration. And we can um, sort of place this in context by looking at the temperature profile with the seasonal cycle. So if you just focus on the warm temperatures, or the warm layers up here in spring, where we have this contribution of, where we have this cross system velocity, um, and this is the 26 degree isotherm, yeah? So you can see that the 26 degree isotherm really only exists in spring and early summer. Um, and yeah, so we are talking about a relatively shallow layer here. With this layer will be close to the surface. Again, we're not entirely sure that this would be vertical. It might be more meridional transport. Um, but because this layer is so shallow close to the surface, it, it, uh, it's also easy to imagine that this is driven by the solar penetration. And now I'd like to look a little bit at the reason for the modulation in the vertical mixing component. Um, and the vertical mixing, especially on the equator, is driven by the vertical shear of the equatorial undercurrent. So I've plotted the equatorial and the seasonal cycle of the equatorial undercurrent here. And again, I have overlain the isotherms um, for us to see where in the column we are. So you can really nicely see here that the 24 to 20 degree isotherm, they're roughly horizontal and they're, they, they really resemble the thermocline quite well. But again, the 26 degree isotherm um, sort of is a different regime. And even though we have the strongest um, equatorial undercurrent in spring, we have a reduced westward surface current. So therefore reduced vertical shear, and this is the vertical shear due to uh, the equatorial undercurrent, and therefore less contribution of vertical mixing as compared to summer where we have a less strong equatorial undercurrent but more vertical shear. So this explains the seasonal modulation of cross thermal velocity. Um, now we can look at even shorter timescales and look at sub-seasonal timescales. And I'll remind you of the video that I've shown you in the beginning, where we saw sea surface temperature, uh, sea surface temperatures of the tropical Pacific, and we could see these wave-like filaments moving to the west. And those are tropical instability waves. Another way to see tropical instability waves in a static picture is from this image here, a Hofner diagram, where we go up in time as we go up on the y-axis and to the west as we go to the left and the x-axis. So what I'd like you to notice, so first, if we just focus at 140 or 120, it's warm in spring, it's colder uh, later on in the year. We've already discussed that a bit. Um, but what I'd like you to, what I'd like to draw your attention to is these sort of streak-like 
cold temperatures that are moving up in time into the west. So these are the west for propagating tropical instability waves. And now we might wonder, okay, so um, they, we know that they modif modify the gradients and they might modify mixing. Um, do they modify the cross thermal velocity? And so if you now compare this Hoffmuller of C surface temperature to a Hoffmuller of cross thermal velocity, you will notice that first, um, again, the seasonal modulation, so there's very little cross thermal velocity here happening during spring, much more later on. But you can definitely also, okay, my arrows aren't great, but you can definitely also see these um, streaks propagating to the west with time. And we can compare this to the vertical mixing component of the cross thermal velocity, and again, we recognize these streaks. And this is um, a year 2010. Um, I like to look at more than just one year. So I'm just showing you 2005 also for comparison, now overlaying here with um, meridional velocity, which is also a good indicator of cross uh, of tropical instability waves, excuse me. And again, we can now really clearly see these streaks. Um, and maybe I might note that this here, where we have much more tropical, uh, much more cross thermal velocity here in 2010 is a La Nina year in the model and 2005 is a neutral year. So you might see some overlapping influence of time scales um, and background background um, um, environment due to La Nina or neutral conditions or anthropic instability waves and the seasons. So I'll just point out here that it's really hard to disentangle these processes, um, but I think we have good evidence to say that the tropical instability wave have a rectified effect on the cross thermal velocities. All right, so I'm going to wrap up by taking us back to where we started and asking the question, how much do diabetic processes contribute? So we started um, talking about the warm water volume. Uh, and before I've shown you a time series of the warm water volume itself, now I'm showing you a time series of dd warm water volume dt. And so the change in warm water volume over the same box that we've talked about in the beginning and sort of in the um, theory of the recharge discharge oscillator, I'm going to plot over this the horizontal. So this is mostly driven by the meridional divergence or convergence, um, which you can see follows the cross uh, follows the change in warm water volume pretty closely, and it explains or a, a change or it contributes seven sweat drops. And we can maybe some of you already remember that actually the diabetic contribution to the warm water volume was also seven sweat drops. So if we put that on top. Um, we can see that while it might not follow the shorter timescale variability of the warm water volume change quite as closely as the meridional, it has this pronounced low frequency um, variability that we've noted before, and it actually also contributes just as much to the warm water volume change as the meridional change. So just want to repeat that this is a process that we can't just assume, um, we, we really need to understand this process to be able to make really good and reliable predictions. Okay, I've said it before, I'll say it again, diabetic processes matter and they contribute significantly to the warm water volume budget. There's hardly any water mass transformation during El Nino, at least um, increasing the feedback of keeping the sea surface temperatures warm. Um, there is water mass transformation happening throughout the year, but it's closer to the surface. So on those time scales, it's likely to matter less for the warm water volume budgets because that's tied to the 20 degree isotherm. Um, at the surface, throughout the seasonal cycle, the, warm, the water mass transformation is dominated by solar penetration. And in the thermocline, we have and the main contribution of vertical mixing. Tropical instability waves look like they have a rectified effect onto warm uh, water mass transformation. And I'll just have summarized my results here uh, with this little schematic. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Awesome. Thanks very much, Anna, for that really nice talk. Thank I really you. appreciated all your clear visualizations. Um, so as always, if you have questions, you can uh, type them in the chat or raise your hand in Zoom. I'm gonna start with a question that just came in the chat from Chris. Um, I liked your talk to the changes in WCI with ENSO modulate ENSO or does ENSO modulate WCI or are they just highly correlated? Yeah, and that's a really great question. <laughs> and one that I've looked into more but it's really hard to figure out because 
on shorter timescales, these cross-system velocities, they're kind of noisy, so it's, it's not really easy to correlate. In the paper that we've published on this, we found that it is modulated by the background conditions. During La Nina, for example, you have a stronger equatorial undercurrent, you have stronger shear, and that leads to stronger mixing, uh, higher diffusivities, and that leads to stronger cross thermal velocity. Um, I, that's why I kind of kept saying it at least amplifies the feedback. Um, right now, I can't conclusively say it drives ENSO. Um, I, I would assume it contributes, but I need to do some more time series analysis to say that conclusively. Those thanks. Um, we will move to a question from Gokhan. Go ahead. Yeah, Anna, uh, you probably said it and I missed it. Uh, I had a question about the water mass transformation associated with the uh, solar penetration. Uh, it seems to be uh, confined to a relatively narrow band in temperature space. Wh why is that the case? Especially given that uh, solar penetration has a vertical, strong vertical gradient and exponential decay, I was expecting maybe a broader spread in temperature space. Yeah, uh, that's a good question, Gokhan. And that's this um, thing about thinking in temperature space versus in depth space. Because I think, so it, it definitely penetrates deeper than might look from temperature space, but that's because um, close to the surface, so where we're at, at, at lower depth, we have a non-stratified mixed layer, right? So that's not really very well resolved by the temperature. So it's an issue of, um, yeah, because the temperatures, the temperature surfaces move, you can't directly link that to a depth. So um, yeah, and during ENSO, for example, El Nino, you saw that it was not confined to quite as narrow um, a temperature space. And that's because during ENSO, you can have ENSOs with, I don't know, I'm just saying something, 28 or 29 degrees Celsius. So you're spreading the influence of solar penetration over 28 and 29 degrees, right? Um, whereas maybe during La Nina, you usually might have 24 degrees Celsius at the surface. So then the influence would be confined to 24 and a little less degrees. Okay. Does that help? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Question from Maria, go ahead. Hi, Anna, really interesting talk. Thank you so much. And I really love the visualizations and your explanations. They really helped for clarifying some um, concepts that I have very limited understanding of um, in the subsurface. But I was wondering if you could, and maybe I missed this, um, could you kind of go over again some of the physical mechanisms for like, let's say your second point where you say hardly any water mass transformation during El Nino, like what are the physical me mechanisms that contribute to that? And I guess it seems like there are some that come from the atmospheric side and then some from the ocean side. Um, yeah, so if you could just explain that um, for me, please. Of course, yeah, thanks. Uh, it's interesting because I had a whole part on this in previous seminars is where I show a lot of um, profiles in the ocean uh, and I decided to skip that. So I'm really happy that you guys paid attention and are asking about these physical mechanisms. So um, the modulation of water mass transformation during El Nino, as we've seen in the thermocline, arises from the vertical mixing component. So what we've done and the vertical mixing um, the vertical mixing itself depends on the vertical shear of, of course, V and U, so the zonal and the meridional component, but usually the vertical shear contribution from the zonal component is more important than it is in this case. So I'm just going to talk about that. So um, during El Nino, you have a weakened equatorial undercurrent and therefore a weakened shear. So you have also less trade winds, so you have less waters going going west. Um, so less water is going west and water are less hard, like less fast going east. So you have less shear. And that results in a reduced um, diffusivity coefficient. So that results in less vertical mixing. And during La Nina, you have the opposite where you might have a stronger, sort of narrower, more confined equatorial undercurrent that, that result and surface current um, to the west by the strength and trade winds, which results in more 
um, vertical shear, which results in more vertical mixing. So that's the main physical process behind the modulation during El Nino and La Nina. I hope that helps. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, let's go to a question from Justin, and then we're going to get to some questions in the chat. Go ahead, Justin. Very nice talk, Anna. Very well explained. I had a quick question about the uh, tropical instability waves, and you said those are rectified effects. So it looks like during a certain phase, there's enhanced mixing and transformation. And then during another phase, it looks like it, it doesn't go kind of below the normal, but it's maybe, I'm just wondering, because it, if it was symmetric with phase that you had enhanced mixing in one phase and reduced in another, then it wouldn't be rectified, I think. But I think what you're showing right. is that there's one phase where it's strongly inducing vertical mixing and that's dominating. Does that sound right? Yeah, yeah, you got that right. I'll just bring this slide back up. So um, I will say or preface this with that it's really hard to find out about the vertical, uh, about the mixing and, and the phase relationship with tropical instability waves from five day averages. I right. think we might be um, smoothing the the, gra the gradients in our average just too much to really find out about the phase. But the thing that makes me think that there's a rectify effect is that if you look at, you can identify, I guess, the tropical instability waves here going sort of up and left. And if you look at this field of cross isothermal velocity, and this is again, averaged over um, a couple of isotherms in the thermocline so that I don't just you know, pick out one isotherm that might have a positive um, value and below it might have a negative value. I don't really see this dipole. I've also looked in depth and I really see a lot of red, right? And not as much blue. So it looks like in total, it's not symmetric around the face, but there is some increased cross isothermal velocity due to the tropical instability wave and not the opposite effect after. So that's why I'm thinking that there's a rectified effect, but again, I, I'd like to quantify this more and I'm currently working on it, but I haven't gotten to that yet. Okay. So there, there's probably some enhancement of vertical shear, do you think, during, the, during that phase? Right, exactly. But again, with the five daily data, I'm not sure if we can see that because it, it might be such a narrow band. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, right. we might look at we, we might look into this more maybe with a, a model that has higher temporal resolution output. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, some questions came in the chat. So, question from Billy: How can we reconcile the result that WCI is about a third of the total W, but about a half of the WWV change? Maybe you can define that for those of us who don't know. At least when integrating across the basin don't these have to balance? Wait, I have to open the chat. <laughs> yeah, sure. and read that again. Um, I actually don't know how to do this now here. How can we inside the result? I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure they have to balance. Um, uh, let me think about this because if we think about, um, I mean, the other half is meridional, which is uh, is horizontal, which is mo mostly meridional. Um, so that's not that's not zonal. So that's not the part of the upwelling that's adiabatic and flowing along the isotherms. Um, so I'm not sure they have to balance. Is at least in this comparison where we're comparing something that's horizontal um, transport that's mostly driven by the meridional to the upward cross as a thermal diabetic. So I think we would have to make a different different comparison to, to balance those. Billy, I'm happy to chat more later. <laughs> okay, uh, let's move to a question from Joe Trivia. Any impact of biology in influencing the difference in solar penetration between La Nina and El Nino? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. So we have climatologically prescribed chlorophyll here. So if there's an influence, we are not resolving it. Um, a seasonal cycle of climatologi climatological chlorophyll, uh, which I assume um, just means. And so we would have to look at that in 
um, it definitely might, right? I mean, if we have more chlorophyll, we would have less sonal penetration and it could, that could offset the balance. So that might definitely be important. Um, but in this case, we haven't looked at that. Okay, Isla, go ahead. Thanks, nice talk. Um, I missed at the beginning what data you're using. So my question might not be relevant, but I was wondering about in course resolution climate type GCMs, is, is this all kind of represented? Is that what you were looking at? Or and does it have any bearing on kind of this debate over whether we're doing things wrong in the tropical Pacific projecting an El Nino-like response to climate change? Um, thanks for the question. I, I So I look at a 10 kilometer horizontal resolution. Um, so this is quite high, high resolution. In principle, I mean, cross S and velocity should be, um, especially should be represented in coarser models too. It might not be just as closely confined to the equator and it kind of depends on the representation of the equatorial undercurrent because that drives the vertical shear, which drives the mixing, which drives the cross and velocity. So I think I would say that it depends on, on the representation of that. Um, okay. And when it comes to tropical instability waves, I mean, that gets a little harder, the coarser, <laughs> the coarser you go. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Peter, go ahead. Yes, Anna, very nice talk. Um, do these results give any indication of how the water, warm water volume can be monitored from observations, so improve and so forecast? So um, thanks for the question. So actually, we are working on informing the Tropical Pacific Observing System. So we've been thinking about um, what can we recommend, what kind of um, what kind of observations would we need. We are more focused on what kind of observations do we need to represent the processes correctly, um, because now these results are from models, and um, we have very little. Um, information specifically about, well, mixing anywhere else apart from 140 or 125 on the equator. And also we don't know anything off the equator, so we don't really know about this structure. We would like to have more observations to make sure that we get the processes correct. If this, I mean, this correlation with, um, warm, with water mass transformation and El Nino phase, um, again, I haven't really, I haven't been able to find whether it lags or leads yet. If it did lead, then we could have some measurement of cross isothermal processes, which probably would have to in, uh, include some mixing method measurements. And then we could you know, inform um, if there's less mixing happening, it could potentially, we could be moving into a warmer phase. But yeah, um, uh, direct measurements about how to better, I don't know, incorporate or predict answer right now. Um, I mean, we take the route via the processes. <laughs> Great, thanks. Yeah, I had that same question about ENSO predictability. So thanks for sharing your thoughts. Let's take one last question from Wei, go ahead. Hey, Anna, um, thank you so much for the seminar. Excellent, excellent talk. Um, I was just wondering if you have looked at the water mass transformation leading to the development of El Nino or La Nina. I was asking because I'm curious about if you see any signature of the effect of Kelvin waves um, on the water mass transformation. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Hui. Thanks for bringing that back up because I remember watching your talk a while ago and then thinking, oh, I should check that. And I actually, I haven't seen um, the propagation yet. I mean, I should be able to see that with the five daily data. So um, it, this is an interesting point and I'm, I'm going to have a look, but I haven't yet. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thanks everybody for the questions. That was a great discussion. And yeah, thank you for all the ideas. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> and yeah, I'll just say briefly next week is our last CGD seminar and uh, Andrew Gettleman will be the speaker. So hope, hope you can join for that. And uh, thanks again, Anna, for a great talk and great discussion. Thanks. Mm -hmm.